Hello everyone, this is T.J. Gifford coming to you once again from the Lake City Church of Christ. I sure hope that you're having a good day, and I would like to say thank you for joining us for yet another study in the book of James. Go ahead and take your Bibles, if you will, and be turning with me to James chapter 5, beginning at verse number 1. Again, that is James 5, beginning at verse number 1. Here James writes these words. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Verse 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now, we may be reading this book of James, this book of practical wisdom for day-to-day -day Christian living, and we may, we may be wondering, how does this fit in the book itself? Well, here what James is doing is he's offering a warning to those who are rich. Now, he's not condemning being rich. He's not condemning having money. But what he is doing is he's generalizing the word rich as for those who are oppressing those who are less fortunate. And with that being said, we really have two points in this section of Scripture. Point number one is a warning given to the rich. And point number two, he talks a little bit about their injustices, their sins. And so to begin with, in verses 1, 2, and 3, he uses the word rich. And of course, the word rich is simply referring to those who are more fortunate in this life to those who have, uh, who have more money, who have more food, who have more buildings and clothes and assets and, 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 and all of these type of things. He's talking about those who are more fortunate in this life, who don't have to work nearly as hard to get what they've got. Now, also keep in mind that sometimes if we're not careful, we may take our American 21st century mindset into the text. And we're fortunate as Americans because we have what we call the American dream. If I work hard enough and I put myself in the right positions, I can achieve a whole lot of success in this life. But the American dream is somewhat foreign to most of human history. You see, if a person was rich in first century Palestine when these words were first given, they probably received that inheritance from their father. They probably received those lands or, or those crops or those cattle or that money from by means of inheritance. And so with that being said, uh, it was not, we're not talking about just those who work really hard and are successful. He's generalizing the word rich to refer to those who are very well off, but they often get that way by taking advantage of those underneath them. He goes on to say in this first three verses that the rich are to weep and howl for their miseries. Now, the, this word weep, of course, literally means to shed tears. And this word howl carries with it even more uh, importance and, and emphasis when it means to utter cries of distress, that is to shout out loud the pain that exists in our hearts. And he tells the rich that you may, in, in essence, you may be really well off in this life and you may think that you have everything that money can buy, but at the end of the day, you need to be weeping and you need to be crying out loud. Why? He says, for your miseries, underline it, that are coming upon you. Now, I may be reading this for the first time and be thinking, James, what miseries do the rich have? What type of unfortunate events is coming upon the rich? Well, what he's again talking about is the rich who oppress those around them. And he answers that in verse number 2. He says, Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and your silver, they are corroded. Now, let's break this down a little bit. In the first century Palestine, one did not have wealth simply by having a bank account full of money. 
they would acquire wealth in a number of different ways. This first statement, your riches are corrupted. Riches that could easily get corrupted are things like crops and buildings and structures and uh, things of that nature. You may re remember on one occasion Jesus talked about a man who was so successful at farming that he had uh, such an enormous crop that he tore down his smaller barns to build bigger barns. And so his fortune was laid up in crops and, and barns and buildings and structures. He says, you may, take, you may place your importance upon your riches, but one day they will be corrupted. The English Standard Version says they will be rotted. Those crops will be rotted. All of those barns that you build out of wood, it will be rotted. One day that will happen if that's where you place your trust is in riches. He goes on to say that your garments will be moth-eaten. They also acquired wealth by, by collecting fine fabrics. Fabrics and certain expensive materials to make garments from was not so easy to come by in that day. And so if you had certain garments, you would show your wealth by just how fine those fabrics were, he says the moths will eat them up. doesn't matter how expensive they are. He goes on to say that if you have gold and silver, it will be corroded. Literally, it will be covered in rust. And so the idea is that you are putting your trust in the wrong things. You think that life is well, and you think that you are rich, and you think that you have it made, but all of these material things in which you place your trust, it will let you down. Now, the obvious application may be to us today, and you may be thinking, Preacher, I'm not rich. I don't have all kinds of riches and fine linens and, and silver and gold flowing over. I don't have all of that. Well, I don't either. But in a sense, if we're living in America today and we have electricity and running water and a roof over our head and relatively nice clothes and shoes to wear and we get three square meals a day and we have modern conveniences like the internet and smartphones, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we are richer than the rich people spoken of in this passage by a long shot. And so with that being said, the warning is, don't place your trust in these material riches. They will let you down. There's coming a day in which they will be taken away. Now the second half of the text, that is here in James 5 verses 4, 5, and 6, he wants to document some of their injustices. If you notice the passage, he says in verse number 4, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by, underline it, fraud, they cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth means the Lord of hosts. Now, the injustice, to, to, to begin with, they were unjust, and they took advantage of those less fortunate than them, in that they would hire workers, they would hire employees, people to tend to their fields and let them do all the work and not pay them. They kept back the wages by fraud, the Bible says. And so what's interesting about that is that the Bible says that this injustice does not go unnoticed. You may think you're getting by with it. You're living in your big houses with all of your silver and gold and your fine linens and all of your riches. And you may think that you're getting by with it because, let's face it, in this life, if you have money, if you have riches, you can get by with more. That's just the way it works. But he's giving them this reminder that the Lord of hosts sees it. The cries of those who have been taken advantage of, they are reaching the ears of the Lord in heaven. And, and by the way, that should be a sobering thought to us today, and that is that the Lord hears our cries. Even when justice isn't found in this life, even when it goes unnoticed by the authorities of our day, the Lord hears our cries. This reminds me of the two instances where Jesus went into the temple and saw people who were traveling there for the purpose of serving and honoring God for the feast days to be taken advantage of. And he goes and he makes a whip and he drives out the money changers and he turns over the tables and he quotes the Old Testament passage that my father's house will not be a den of thieves. And so with all of that said, why did Jesus, why was Jesus provoked to that righteous indignation? Because he could not bear seeing 
innocent people taken advantage of. And God sees that from heaven above and judgment will be pronounced upon those who do such. He goes on to document their injustices in verse number 4. And by the way, you see this again in verse number 6. But in verse number 4, he documents that they are taking advantage of their employees, of their workers, of those less fortunate. But verse number 5, they're doing this while they themselves live in luxury. Notice verse number 5. He says in verse 5, While you're taking advantage and frauding people out of their hard-earned wages, verse 5, you're, while you're doing that, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury... And notice what he says, You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Now, this is a short passage and there's not a whole lot to unpack here, but here's the gist of what we just read and studied, that there are people in this life more fortunate than others. And if we find ourselves in that category of being fortunate, and if we can see how easy it is to get by taking advantage of others, don't do it. Don't do it because what the Bible is telling us is that if we put our trust in riches and gold and silver and fine apparel, then it will let us down. It will rot. It will corrode. It will rust. It will one day be no more. And while we have such fortune in this life, which by the way we all do as Americans, may we look at those who are less fortunate. Don't take advantage of them, but help them. Whether we are rich or poor, whether we are fortunate or unfortunate, may we all remember the words of Jesus Christ when He said to us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. The golden rule, treat others the way we would like to be treated. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, in a world where there is injustice, in a world where there is a degree of poverty that still afflicts humanity, in a world where some of us have it very well off, but others do not, may we remember these words and love our neighbors as ourselves. I want to say thank you for joining us for this brief study in the book of James. I pray that it has been useful and profitable in your life. We invite you to come back and join us next week. Until then, take care and God bless.